Hello and welcome to the Physician Assistant Exam Review Podcast. This is Season 2, Episode 9, where we're continuing to cover GYN, and today we're covering specifically uh, cervical and vaginal issues. Okay, so we're picking up again with GYN. We covered menstruation last week, uh, problems with it, the normal function there. You can go back and check that out if you like. And this week we're going to be covering vaginal and cervical issues. Before we jump in, I just wanted to read one quick email from a from someone who just passed their test to hopefully uh, instill a little bit of confidence into those of you who have your exams coming up. Uh, let me just read. Hi, Brian. I wanted to thank you for your podcast. I listen to them on the way to and from work as well as to the gym or well as at the gym. They're fantastic. I took my panry on August 1st and found out yesterday I passed with flying colors. Some of the test questions I remember you reviewing and I would never have gotten them right if I hadn't been listening to your show. Just wanted to let you know that your podcasts are helping PAs in, here in Florida. Thank you again. That's from Lindsay. Um, so absolutely listen to the show, do your work, study. You can absolutely pass this thing. It's all about passing the test. I I wrote to someone today. It is, it's a little about practicing medicine, but really not. It's more about being able to pass this exam. So with focusing on the right things, focusing on what we're, what's important, focusing on things that will help you pass the exam is what I really want to do here. And to me, that's the, that's the gist of what we're, we're trying to do. Um, I understand Practicing medicine is super important. Doing the best you can at work is super important. But what we're focused on specifically is passing your exam. And I think each and every one of you should have no problem doing that, provided that you focus on the right things and provided that you uh, spend time covering the right things and boosting up your confidence and learning how to take tests and study. Uh, So that's why we spend so much time on that here on this particular show. All right, so let's jump in without further ado to our priming questions. Question number one, list list two risk factors for developing cervical cancer. List two risk factors for developing cervical cancer. And again, even if you haven't covered this yet in school, whatever, just guess, make it up, try your best. That effort will will pay off even if you don't see it immediately. Two risk factors for developing cervical cancer. Most of them revolve around multiple sexual partners, uh, sexual partners who have multiple sexual partners, uh, younger age of first sexual intercourse, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then there's smoking, which is the other one that is the, the major category here. What surgical procedure is used to help an incompetent cervix during pregnancy? What surgical procedure is used to help an incompetent cervix during pregnancy? And it's called a cerclage. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. KOH prep will diagnose which type of vaginitis? A KOH prep is used to diagnose which type of vaginitis. And it's candida or yeast infection. All right, so let's start with the cervix. Um, Cervical dysplasia and carcinoma. So let's do some terms at the beginning here to make sure that everybody's clear. A neoplasia is an abnormal growth of cells. Dysplasia is an abnormal development typically with an excess of immature cells. And then cervical dysplasia and carcinoma have been linked to human papillomavirus, HPV, uh, which most of you are pretty much aware at this point. Risk factors for contracting HPV. would be, like I said at the beginning, uh, sexual activity increases risk for exposure to HPV. So the younger the age of the first intercourse, the greater the risk. Risk increases with number of sexual partners. Risk increases with sexual partners who have multiple sexual partners. And then use of condoms or a diaphragm will decrease the risk. Uh, HPV exposed patients should be monitored closely. Um, slow, slow, <laughs> low socio, socioeconomic status is also a risk factor. And then again, smoking. One thing I want to point out before we move too far into the discussion of HPV, uh, cervical dysplasia, is the idea that HPV is, is everywhere. Okay, there's tons of it. It's just the different strains that cause different issues. So... For example, plantar warts are caused by HPV. So f- f- warts on the bottom of your foot. HPV 1, 2, 4, and 63 will cause plantar warts. Common warts, the kind you get in your fingers or wherever else, are HPV 2, 7, and 22. Anogenital warts are HPV also, and that's 6, 11, 42, and 44. So they cause all of these different warts in different places, usually based on the, ki- the type of HPV it is. Now, our high-risk 
types of cerv- for cervical cancer are 16, 18, 31, and 45. Now, the list is longer, and it is longer for each and every one of the ones I just covered, and they cause different things. And there, there are, I forget what the number is, but there are hundreds of these um, different types of HPV. So to me, the ones you really should hold on to, the ones you should remember, are the ones that deal with cervical cancer, 16, 18, 31, and 45. And again, that may be a little bit even more depth than we need for the pants or the panry, but if I'm gonna remember anything, those are the ones I'm gonna remember. But what I want you to key into is that HPV causes causes warts. So it can be anything from common warts, plantar warts, anogenital warts, and then cervical issues and dysplasia. But I, I just want that picture to be clear for you. So I'm gonna I put together a little diagram. I'll put that up on the website. Uh, you can go check that out at www.physicianassistantexamreview.com. Uh, and then if you pull up the section on uh, episode nine, cervical and vaginal issues. So <laughs> moving along. So we discussed our risk factors for for being exposed to HPV. Our presentation, really patients aren't going to come in with any specific problem. It's going to be the routine pap smear that's going to be on their normal yearly exam. But there aren't really going to be any symptoms unless there's some seriously invasive disease. So our labs and studies, again, the papanuclear nucleo smear. So this can be we can come back as anything from normal to mild cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, CIN1, moderate cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, CIN2, severe cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, CIN3, it's hard to say, uh, carcinoma in situ, CIS, and about one third of severe cervical intraepithelial neoplasia will progress to, to carcinoma in situ. So that's something worth noting. Um, about a third of those will, will move directly forward. A colposcopy, so putting a scope into the vagina and looking around, you can do a Schiller test, which is to paint the cervix with Lugol's iodine and the cells that do not pick up the stain should be biopsied. A biopsy, there are a couple different ways you could do this. You can just do a punch biopsy. You can do an endocervical curatage, or you can do a conization. So this is the removal of a cone-shaped area of the cervix, including the entire transformational zone. And this can be done either with a scalpel or a laser or a... um, electrosurgical loop or leap excision. So that's loop extrasurgical excision procedure. Um, and that's most commonly how I see it done is um, with that electro electrocorder in a loop. A treatment. So this falls in the treatment, although obviously it's not tr- necessarily treatment. It's the vaccination, which is uh, Gardasil and Cerevax. These vaccines are for patients not previously exposed to HPV. They're recommended for women ages 9 to 26, and that's an area of debate. Uh, conization is another is the treatment that we said before. We could do it for a biopsy, but it's also a way to treat uh, cervical dysplasia. So it may be used to treat pre-invasive CIN. If we're just going to remove what we think is uh, tissue that that may be a problem, so CIN one or CIN two, uh, we can go ahead and just remove it with a conization. If we have a, a bigger issue on our hands, like CIN three or carcinoma in situ, we're, we may go on to a hysterectomy with pelvic lymphadenectomy. So taking out some nodes. Uh, for more advanced disease, and then radiation treatment may also be necessary. Cervical incompetence is another issue with the cervix. So the cervix dilates in the faces before labor begins. This is a concern when it threatens the viability of the pregnancy or leads to premature uh, labor. So the clinical presentation here is really going to be routine prenatal exams. You're going to do a bi-manual and then a vaginal ultrasound. And the treatment, like we said earlier, is a cerclage. You take the patient to the operating room and you basically put a stitch to reinforce the cervix. Our last topics, uh, our last issue with the cervix is cervicitis, which is an infection of the cervix, which is similar to urethritis in men. And we'll get to that down the road. Presentation here is going to be pelvic discomfort and mucopurulent discharge. On your physical exam, the cervix will be friable. And again, you'll have that discharge. You can do a gram stain, but it's difficult to isolate a specific organism. Chlamydia trichomitis and Neisseria gonorrhea make up about 40% of cases. And trichomonas vaginalis is also pretty common. Treatment is going to be based on the organism, although like we said, it's hard to isolate a specific organism from the cervix. Uh, for, a, for a pure chlamydia infection, the CDC currently rec- recommends azith- azithromycin, one gram oral in a single dose, or doxycycline 100, mi- 100 milligrams PO twice daily for seven days. For a pure Neisseria infection, they recommend ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams IM, in a sing- again, in a single dose, 
plus azithromycin, one gram PO in a single dose. So what they're doing with the azithromycin is really recovering for, for chlamydia. And they're talking about even in a, in a pure chlamydia that probably you should use uh, erythromycin as well in addition to cover for the gonococcal, uh, the, pos- the possibility that there's a gonococcal infection as well. So keep that in mind. Um, it's going to be azithromycin or uh, ceftriaxone, depending on which organism you you think it's going to be. Again, I'm not. Sh- it's just hard to say how how specific they're going to be on your exam uh, for these. As we get into infectious disease down the road, we'll cover chlamydia and Neisseria in much more detail and give you a whole better picture there. All right, so that finishes up the cervix for us. We're going to move on to um, uh, vaginal and vulvar issues. So we're going to first going to begin talking about neoplasms. These are uh, the malignancies here are most commonly squamous cell carcinomas. Vaginal cancer is very rare, but it is rated on the one to three scale um, for dysplasia, just like uh, cervical issues or so vulvar interepithelial neoplasms or VIN, VIN1 is mild, two is moderate, three is severe, and then we get two vulvar carcinoma in situ. So very similar scaling to uh, cervical issues. Risk factors would be an HPV infection, history of vulvar interepithelial neoplasm, history of cervical cancer, history of cervical intraepithelial neoplasms, HIV infection, and smoking. Clinical presentation here is going to be a routine office visit. Um, you may have vulvar itching. That's the most common complaint, vaginal bleeding, or possibly a vaginal mass. Labs and studies, you can do some staining here uh, with acetic acid, tulidine blue staining, Lugol's iodine staining, a colposcopy, again, which is sticking a scope into the vagina and looking around, and then obviously biopsying this tissue and sending it off to pathology is going to be our most definitive answers. Treatment um, for a vulvar neoplasm, we're going to do, lar- la- we're probably going to do a local excision uh, or a vulvectomy, and then radiation and chemotherapy, depending on uh, what that tissue comes back on, comes back as. Vaginal cancer, um, we, we're going to wind up doing a radical hysterectomy, upper vaginectomy, pelvic lymphadenectomy, and intercavity or external beam radiation. Something I see you absolutely getting a question on because it's so easy to write them is vaginitis. I even put one at the beginning and I'm sure I put one at the end because like I said, it's just so easy to write these questions. There are three main classes of vaginitis. You have your yeast infection, your trichomonas infection, and your bacterial vaginosis or BV. Your clinical presentation is going to be vaginal irritation, pruritus, pain or burning, and then um, some sort of discharge, either profuse or foul smelling. We'll get into the specifics in just a second. Lab studies and physical exams. Um, you're going to culture the cervix, but again, difficult to culture the vagina and the cervix. You're just going to get a, a the, the, there's a lot of bacteria there. It's hard to isolate anything. Vaginal pH normal is 4.5 or less. We'll talk about that in a second, why that matters for us. Microscopic examination of the, of the discharge is going to help us out also, so that's going to be part of what, how you work these up, is looking at the discharge under a microscope. And then obviously careful inspection of the vulva, vagina, and vagina and cervix um, during your exam. So you're going to do a, do a complete exam, make sure you're, you're, you're seeing everything. So for the first type we're going to cover is candida albicans or a yeast infection. So that's going to be our first vaginitis we're talking about. Risk factors for developing yeast infection is the use of antibiotics. Using antibiotics will kill off some of the natural flora in the vagina and will allow the yeast to proliferate, causing yeast infection. Use of corticosteroids can increase the risk of uh, yeast infection, diabetes, pregnancy, and moisture and heat in that area. Clinical presentation is uh, pruritus, burning, dyspareunia, and then our classic term here is the white cottage cheese or curd-like discharge. That's our, the one that's bolded on the website and our key term for, for uh, Canada infection. Labs and studies. Our microscopic exam, we're going to do a 10% potassium hydroxide, which shows hyphae and spores. That's for uh, Canada albicans. That's our potassium hydroxide, our KOH prep. In this case, also the vaginal secretions will have a pH greater than 4.5. So that's something else to note that can differentiate uh, a yeast infection from other bacterial, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> from other vaginitis. A treatment is going to be topical azoles, uh, or, or one option, and then another option is going to be oral fluconazole, 150 milligram oral tablet, single dose, and then you can repeat it if necessary. All right, I ran through that really quick. Let me just try to recap 
So we've got three types of vaginitis. We've got bacterial, we've got trichomonas, and we've got a yeast infection. For the yeast infection, they're going to have white curd-like discharge, uh, itching and burning. Microscopic exam under KOH prep should give us hyphae and spores. We treat it either with top topical azoles or, more commonly, an oral flu fluconazole 150 milligram tablet, single dose, which can be repeated if necessary. Next, we're going to cover trichomonas vaginosis, which is a flagellated protozoan that's sexually transmitted. Presentation is going to be pruritus again, but in this time, it's going to be a malodorous, frothy, yellow-green discharge. So that's going to be your key term here for trichomonas is that um, really bad-smelling yellow-green discharge with severe vaginal erythema. We're going to do a wet mount, and you're going to see mo uh, modal flagellates. So you're going to see those uh, protozoan that can move around. Our treatment in this case is going to be metronidazole, two grams one time, which may be repeated if not cleared, and all partners should be, should be treated. This is a sexually transmitted disease. Everybody gets treated. Metronidazole, two grams. Lastly, in this category, we have bacterial vaginosis. It's a poly polymicrobial infection and not necessarily sexually transmitted. We have a gray, frothy, melodious discharge. On the wet mat, you will see clue cells. That's our clue here, our, our, our key term, epithelial cells covered in bacteria. And then we have the whiff test, which is a KOH will enhance the odor of this discharge. Treatment is going to be metronidazole 500 milligrams PO BID times 7. Or you can use clindamycin. Again, in this case, sexual partners don't necessarily need to be treated. This is not a sexually transmitted disease as trichomonas is. Lastly, we have condyloma cuminata, which is our anogenital warts I talked about briefly before. Um, this is also going to be HPV, but this is most commonly 6 and 11, and this is a sexually transmitted disease. Our presentation here is going to be warty growths. Um, as far as labs and studies go, acetic acid on the warts will turn them white. We can do a colposcopy. You can biopsy them. Treatment is going to be cryotherapy with liquid nitrogen. CO2 laser or surgical removal. Wow, I really thought that brings us to the end of the cervical and vaginal and vulvar issues. Um, we're about 17 minutes in. I really spent a lot of time putting this material together. I, I thought it was pretty lengthy. Um, I thought we'd actually go long on this, this particular show, uh, but it seems like we're going to wrap it up a little bit early. Um, yeah, so that brings us to the end of that. So let's then jump into our study tip of the week. All right, I know last week I talked about hopping on the email. This is our study tip, so it was a little bit different. This week, again, is going to be um, slightly different. It's not going to be a study tip. I want to talk about uh, an email I got recently, but one that I get fairly frequently, which was the question about uh, people ask, since I, especially since I work in surgery, when students, in particular, when they start their first rotation in surgery, frequently ask me you know, how to do good. What's the best way to handle things? How should they go about uh, doing the best they can on their surgical rotation. So I want to take a minute, and I do answer each of those emails, but I want to take a minute to explain this to everyone, or at least share this with everybody, my thoughts on this topic, uh, because I think it's really important. And in general, when you're looking for a job, when you're doing anything, uh, the, sort of the same techniques, the same things apply. So on your surgical rotation, first of all and foremost, understand that nobody has, <laughs> no one has real high expectations of you. Now that's not to be rude or, or mean. Um, you just don't know what you're doing. You haven't been in an OR before. So step one is learning how to walk into the room and not contaminate things and not bump into things. Walking into an operating room when you first start is hard. Um, you, you don't know what to do. You commonly uh, back up into things you shouldn't be, which is not a big deal. None of it is is a tremendous issue. It's just, it's very obvious to everybody in the room that you've never been in, in an OR before uh, and understand that, they, like I said, so their expectations are, are pretty low at, at the start. That being said, your goal on all your rotations should be the same, which is to make yourself um, as useful to the team as possible, to introduce yourself, to go out of your way, to say hi to people, to shake hands, to say, hi, I'm here to help, uh, to find, introduce yourself to everybody in the room, uh, go out of your way to smile and participate and just show that you, you're someone who wants to be on the team, who wants to be there. Remember, you're paying good money to show up to these places. So, that, And if you don't seem all that interested, you get to do even less. So your job is to show up, be interested, and be someone who they want to have on the team, be someone who they want to have participating. Uh, I had a medical student just this past week. I don't usually get medical students, but once in a while when they're short on residents, 
um, I pick up a general surgeon and a medical student, which happened last week. And she was great. She was really interested. So I let her do a whole heck of a lot that she wouldn't normally be able to do or that I wouldn't have bothered to let her do, except she showed enthusiasm. She showed that she was interested in being there, that she wanted to learn, uh, and she was appreciative of the opportunities that I gave her. That being said, most medical students or PA students you're not going to you're not going to get to do a whole lot. You're not going to get to sew a whole lot in an operating. You're going to get to put in a couple of stitches. So the more you can know ahead of time about how to hold the instruments. That's really step 1. I not even putting in the stitch. It's not even tying the stitch. It's just making it look like you know how to hold the instruments. Uh, if you can put in a stitch, that's even better. But no one's expecting you to come in the door and be able to do this. Um I work a lot in plastics and I don't expect people even who have been trained PAs to come in and help us and be able to do it. It takes months and months and years. And in fact, I recently, after five years of doing this, uh, picked up some new tips and and techniques that have sped me up a lot and made me a whole lot better. These things all take time. This is your first time in the room. Don't get as so nervous about it. Don't get so worked up about it. And again, that goes with all of your rotations. People have their expectations of you are that you're a student and that you're learning. And all they want from you is you to participate in the team, you to be thankful to be there, but yet still eager to learn and be a part of things is really what people are looking for. And if you can do that, you'll get the most out of your rotations and you'll make the biggest impact. And I I think that's what people really want to see from you. So don't worry too much. And of course, obviously, you're going to want to study. I used to like, uh, what is it? Um, Surgical Recall, I think, was the book I liked. Again, I'm, I'm that short question guy, and that's that's a lot how that book was set up. So having that knowledge is helpful, and it shows that you're interested. It shows that you're participating, uh, asking good questions, all of those things. But it's mostly a personality issue and mostly showing your interest, showing that you want to be there, showing that you want to learn, and that you'll do things to help out the team. Uh, I think those are your big factors. But a lot of it is just that social awareness and that ability to communicate and to show your interest. So anyway, that's my feelings on the surgery rotation. We're pretty much rotations in general. Maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that moving forward uh, in an episode down the road, and maybe I'll do one specifically on that. But for now, I I just want to make that as as clear as possible. Show up, smile, be eager, do what you can to help, but don't set your expectations for yourself so high that you're nervous and concerned. Um, Nobody's expecting you to walk through the door and be able to do surgery. It's really not, not what we're looking for. All right, so let's jump in and finish up with our uh, review questions. Clue cell should make you think of what diagnosis? Clue cell should make you think of what diagnosis? Clue cells. Bacterial vaginosis. How do you treat a yeast infection? Fluconazole, 150 milligrams, one tablet. Or you can do topical azoles, but uh, most people do the, the 150 milligram, one tablet of fluconazole. How is cervical dysplasia initially diagnosed? Cervical dysplasia, how is it initially diagnosed? That's going to be your routine yearly pap smear. What three organisms cause the majority of cervicitis? Your answer here is going to be chlamydia, Neisseria, they make up 40%, and then trichomonas is also uh, pretty common. All right, so that wraps up this week's show. Thank you so much for coming out again this week. Um, If you haven't yet, I'd love it if you went over and just left a review on iTunes. I've had a couple of of really nice ones this week uh, that people have left, and it really does a lot to make sure that the show comes up and people search for it. And of course, it helps boost my ego. Uh, So thank you so so much for those. And if you continue to post them, that'd be great. Again, congratulations to everybody who's passed their test this week, who's reached out to me. And good luck to those of you who have your exams coming up in the next week or so. Um, Good luck, take care, and I will see you soon.